Hello, I'm Marlene Saeed. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, reconstruction efforts after earthquakes in Turkey and Syria could cost billions of dollars. That bill is likely to worsen Turkey's already struggling economy. So how will the country cope? Also this week, people in northwestern Syria feel abandoned by the world after the devastating earthquakes. The UN has increased its aid deliveries to the war-torn country, but is it too little too late? Nearly a year after Russia invaded Ukraine, the nation's economy is wrecked. Financial aid from Western donors is helping some businesses survive, but is it enough to keep the entire country going? Turkey's worst earthquakes in nearly a century have killed tens of thousands of people, flattened entire city blocks and wrecked businesses. Response efforts are shifting to coping with the aftermath and providing shelter, food and medical help to survivors. The Turkish president has promised to rebuild affected areas within a year. He's allocating more than $5 billion for initial disaster relief with cash handouts for families. But business groups say the total restoration bill could exceed $84 billion. Rasul Seda reports. Life has come to a halt in the Turkish city of Adiyaman since the earthquake struck last week. And nothing symbolizes that more than this clock tower, a landmark of the city. The clock stopped when the quake shook the region. Like many others here, Jabir Dijle has sent his family members to Istanbul because of the devastation. No natural gas, no electricity, no water, nothing. For food, we rely entirely on the aid distributed in the tent city. More than 1,000 buildings have collapsed here, and around 10,000 people lost their lives. Those who survived are now struggling. Only 25% of the city has water after pipes were heavily damaged. It will take days, if not weeks, to repair them. 60% of residents are living without electricity. None are getting natural gas. This was the largest stadium in Adiyaman. It has now been turned into a tent city that's home to more than 5,000 people. Turkey's environment and urban planning minister Murat Kurum told Al Jazeera that the government will provide people with more shelter and promised homes will be quickly rebuilt. Now some parts of the city are provided with electricity and water. We are repairing the infrastructure of the city now. For natural gas, the process of damage assessment is continuing. Once we fix the pipes, public buildings such as hospitals, schools and buildings that are slightly damaged will be our priority to provide gas. We will rebuild the homes within a year. Business here has also been disrupted and most shops have either collapsed or are heavily damaged. This is what is left of Hijri Özdal's shop. You see, we have lost everything. Whatever we had in the shop is gone. We don't know how we will resume our business again. But at least my family is alive. According to some reports, the earthquakes have already cost Turkey more than $80 billion in losses, or 10% of its gross domestic product. In Adiyaman, the scale of destruction is immense and the displacement of survivors is becoming a humanitarian crisis. Rescuers here are now hearing fever voices from under the rubble. They are gradually shifting from finding bodies to clearing the debris and providing the essential goods and services to tens of thousands who have survived. Resus Erdar, Al Jazeera, Adiyaman, Southern Turkey. Joining us from Istanbul is Hakan Akbash. He's the Managing Director of Strategic Advisory Services. Many thanks for joining the program, sir. The scale of the destruction caused by this earthquake seems so immense. Do we have any idea yet of the economic impact? Thank you so much for having me. And also, I want to thank uh, all your viewers for their amazing solidarity with the Turkish people during this very difficult time. And uh, the humanitarian um, loss uh, has been uh, overwhelming. Uh, obviously, uh, you need to move on and rebuild lives. Uh, according to early estimates, um, right now, we would be looking at $84 billion of uh, economic costs. And uh, almost uh, 70 billion dollars of it would be uh, in the infrastructure and the housing uh, side. 
and uh, around uh, 14 billion dollars in terms of uh, loss uh, manpower uh, as well as impact uh, to the GDP. I would uh, expect probably up to two points of GDP growth from uh, uh, the Turkish uh, economy side uh, this year alone. Uh, one third of Turkey's uh, steel uh, manufacturing uh, and exporting facilities actually had been built in this region. And uh, they were not uh, physically or operationally impacted, but uh, they lost uh, their employees. And uh, from that perspective, uh, they would be losing production probably. They would, be, they would stay closed probably till the end of uh, March. And on top of it, uh, the Iskenderun uh, port also uh, had been impacted, which is a major energy and um, uh, steel export port. This region uh, it, it contributes to about 15% of uh, Turkey's agriculture output. Uh, it will be uh, impacted. Uh, on the production side, in addition to the, um, uh, to the steel industry, obviously uh, textiles, uh, and, and logistic uh, infrastructure also were impacted. Um, from the exports perspective, uh, you know, even like Gaziantep, which was one of the worsted cities, alone contributed to five percent of uh, Turkey's exports. So, uh, so the picking, picking you up, will picking, be huge. Apologies, picking you up on the agricultural uh, side of things. Is that going to have an impact on food inflation, which Turkey has already been dealing with? Uh, yes, uh, obviously at this point uh, we have uh, significantly more problems than inflation, but before these quakes, um, it, it contributed uh, a great deal to the poverty and cost of living. Uh, the official number was about 65% annual inflation. Uh, without any doubt um, with this, uh, it, it will impact the domestic uh, agricultural uh, output, uh, therefore the supply uh, should be hurt and uh, unfortunately inevitably hurt the, uh, the prices and add on to the cost of living in Turkey. What sort of impact do you see on the housing market? You touched on it, but of course we've had this whole controversy around building codes and so on. What impact exactly is it going to have on the housing market? Just to share with you the magnitude and the scale, over 170,000 buildings have been impacted and about 25 to 30,000 uh, of them had been either uh, basically uh, gone or, or impacted. So uh, rebuilding this whole region uh, is going to uh, very, uh, be very important. But I think um, there is also uh, the, um, the regulatory uh, as well as um, the, the um, uh, sort of the moral side of this story because as, as late as uh, in 2018, Turkey passed an amnesty uh, a law for all the uh, zoning in the region, in the country, but also in the region, uh, which is where basically you issue a building code, uh, a building license uh, to subpart buildings. So this has really exposed the underpinnings of all the shady construction uh, that has been going on for uh, the last 20 years. And unfortunately, this is part of uh, the, the populist moves uh, on behalf of the government or any government to really issue these licenses in exchange for votes. And uh, as, as you will know, Turkey was headed for elections uh, on May 14th, but uh, that will surely have an impact on that as well. Mm. As you say, massive reconstruction needed. Can Turkey afford what it's going to cost to rebuild these areas that have been destroyed? Yes. Um, again, Turkey uh, is uh, a G20 uh, country and uh, construction uh, has always been uh, one of the leading uh, sectors uh, in the economy. And, um, and also uh, these numbers, uh, although there's, you know, we're looking at tens of billions of dollars, uh, with the uh, support from uh, domestic and international uh, resources, uh, organizations, uh, they uh, should be able to uh, rebuild lives. It's going to take uh, several years and it's going to impact uh, inevitably the economy and all the Turkish people, uh, you know, uh, through our taxes would be uh, partially paying for this. But uh, it, this, I think this is going to be one of the probably most manageable parts of this, uh, this earthquake. If you were a foreign investor looking at Turkey right now, what, what, how are you looking at Turkey in the, short, in the short run and in the long run? 
Look, um, this was probably one of the uh, worst, deadliest uh, disasters in the history of mankind. And uh, from that perspective, uh, this can happen to anybody. Uh, and, um, and, and as an investor, as a strategic investor, uh, I would tend to look at the uh, mid to long term uh, fundamentals of any country, uh, including Turkey. So from that perspective, before the quake, obviously, uh, it was a young, vibrant, resilient uh, economy with a very hardworking and well educated, um, uh, basically, workforce. And uh, also, uh, the, the location uh, of the country is uh, very strategic, and as part of the customs union with EU, as well as uh, being a, literally a strategic uh, point between East and West, uh, and a very, again, a very vibrant uh, economy, as well as the uh, infrastructures uh, from telecom to uh, education. Uh, it is uh, still uh, a, a high uh, long-term uh, high potential uh, investment area. And also, especially these times, I think um, one would really uh, look at uh, the timing of the investments. And uh, before these quakes, uh, it was already uh, probably one of the uh, cheapest uh, uh, places uh, in terms of asset prices in the world. So from a, a return on investment perspective, uh, even be before these quakes uh, were there. So if uh, for any long-term uh, investors uh, with a strategic game plan, uh, Turkey is definitely, uh, it needs to be put on the agenda. Really interesting to talk to you. Hakan Akbash, Managing Director of the Strategic Advisory Services, talking to us there from Istanbul. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. The situation in Syria is starkly different to that in Turkey. Little international aid has reached parts of the north. Most people there were already displaced because of the country's civil war. Now the earthquakes are compounding their misery. More than four million rely almost entirely on aid to survive. Aid workers have pleaded for help, but the UN has acknowledged it's failed to deliver. It's now appealed for nearly $400 million in aid and boosted deliveries to the area after getting permission from the Syrian president to use two more border crossings from Turkey. The UN was previously restricted to using just one border crossing approved by the Security Council for aid delivery. Other agencies and countries in the region have sent aid shipments by air to Damascus International Airport, but none have reached areas under opposition control. Joining us from Wellington in New Zealand is Karam Shah, an economist and non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. Thank you for joining the programme, sir. Why has the international community been so slow to help Syria? I think there is a combination of factors. Uh, one of the factors is the, the fact that the Assad regime has such a long history of di diverting aid um, and stealing it uh, at times. However, the, the situation in northwest Syria was different. That part which is held by the opposition received far less aid, not because aid is being diverted, although it is being diverted, but to a far lesser extent compared to regime-held Syria. But uh, the response there uh, was virtually non-existent uh, because the United Nations refused to activate its emergency mechanisms and to deliver aid to people in that region without the permission of uh, the Security Council or the Assad regime in Damascus. So the only crossing uh, from Turkey into nor northwest Syria, uh, which is Bab el Hawa, uh, uh, the only crossing which was authorized by the UN for delivering aid was not accessible uh, in the first few days, uh, most critical for rescuing lives, uh, in the first few days of the earthquake. So that meant that the UN could not deliver aid altogether to northwest Syria. Um, now, the response of other countries also bilaterally was uh, very disappointing. Uh, virtually no aid was delivered to northwest Syria, which is the, the part most vulnerable uh, in the country. Bashar al-Assad blamed the sanctions that the US has put on Syria for the lack of aid. Is he right? Sanctions do play a role in hindering the humanitarian response. That's just a fact. Uh, however, the impact of sanctions on the humanitarian response is hugely exaggerated uh, by the Assad regime. So uh, what's 
actually limiting that uh, delivery of aid is uh, the thuggery of the regime, uh, the the diversion. It's it's um, a factor that matters a lot more than sanctions. Now, do sa how do sanctions hinder the humanitarian response? So, say you're an organization based in any country around the world, uh, and you want to send money to to Syria, you would actually struggle to send that money using the formal channels because of. Uh, Western sanctions on Syria. Now, what I mean by saying it hinders the humanitarian response, but it doesn't stop it, there are many alternative ways to getting that money into Syria. Um, there are other uh, impacts for sanctions on the humanitarian response. However, uh, their impact is uh, hugely exaggerated. What is the humanitarian situation in Syria now? Is aid getting in? In a nutshell, the humanitarian situation in the country has never been worse, it, 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 not even uh, during the First World War, um, when Syria was still part of the Ottoman uh, Empire. Aid is getting in, and uh, even though it's actually, it's been dwindling over the past few years with uh, donor fatigue, um, it is actually getting in. The, the main issue is that it's being politicized, it's being diverted, um, and that's why most people are actually not benefiting from it. What more can the international community do to help the plight of the Syrian people? I mean, I think the number one thing that needs to be done is pushing for a political settlement. That's the only thing that's going to help the country stand on its feet again. Um, a political transition that restores the hope of Syrians in, in investing in that country, um, in bringing their money back from abroad uh, into Syria. There are other things which are more operational that need to be done. For instance, aid that's forming the backbone of the economy in Syria now uh, needs to be distributed more equitably. So people who deserve it need to have it. And it's being stolen all around the country to, to varying degrees, obviously. Uh, but something needs to be done about it. And if you allow me to just add the very last thing, I think there is an issue with the United Nations as an institution responsible for delivering humanitarian aid. It remains obsessed with uh, its protocols and the, the sovereignty of its member states, um, instead of focusing on humanitarian needs. I mean, one of the main four pillars of, the humanitar of a humanitarian response is uh, the, the relativ relativity of needs. That is not being met in, okay. in Syria. People who need aid the most are not receiving it. Karam Shah, an economist and non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has uprooted millions of people from their homes, cut off access to its ports and disrupted farming. More than a third of the nation's budget is being spent on battling Russian forces. The economy shrank by more than 30 percent last year. That's the largest decline since Ukraine declared independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Tens of billions of dollars in international aid has helped the government to continue to provide services. The U.S. has provided nearly $50 billion in military, financial and humanitarian aid to Kyiv. Almost half of that went to the military. Several EU institutions provided more than $35 billion in aid to Ukraine. The majority of that amount was allocated for financial help. The United Kingdom was the third highest contributor of aid to Ukraine, with more than $7 billion pledged between January and November. But the IMF says Ukraine needs at least $3 billion a month to finance its wartime economy. And it would cost almost $350 billion to rebuild the country. Ukrainian officials want Western governments to use Russia's frozen assets worth more than $300 billion to fund reconstruction efforts. Let's dig in more into the cost of Russia's invasion on Ukraine's economy. We're joined from London by Yevgenia Slipsova, who is a senior economist at Oxford Economics. Thank you for joining the program. What is your assessment of Ukraine's economy almost a year now into the war? Well, the economy has done better than we feared at the beginning. First, the collapse was around 50 percent in March, um, April, by the end of the year. This contraction narrowed to about 35 uh, percent. 
that notwithstanding massive uh, missile attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. So for the year as a whole, it contracted by 30%, um, which is a huge blow, um, but the economy hasn't collapsed and it's still functioning. Why do you think that is the case? Well, there were two elements that were, that were crucial. The domestic response, which was very effective, the monetary and fiscal response, uh, fixing the... Um, Rivnia, the currency, in, implementing capital controls, avoiding a bank run, also effective uh, bank, uh, commercial bank response, uh, and fiscal authorities. And this uh, fixing of the Rivnia and closed capital controls were also enabled by uh, sustained international support so that the central bank can, uh, could replenish its reserves. And, um, and the rest of the uh, international help that all went to supporting the budget um, and military help, all of those elements were very important. But those loans are going to have to be paid back at some point, aren't they? Um, the debt is building up, obviously, at a huge pace. Uh, but about half of the money that came last year came in the form of grants that was about $32 billion that Ukraine received, and uh, 15 of them, or 17 even, were, were grants, mostly from the U.S. So the amount uh, in new, of new debt was uh, yeah, non-negligible, also around $15 billion, but it was, you know, given the scale of destruction, it was, it was not extraordinary. Um, the debt to GDP is about... 85% uh, as of 2022, which is, again, huge, but a lot of countries with, in peacetime have similar debt levels um, and it's going to reach about 100%. Um, at the moment, the, all the repayment on dollar-denominated debt is suspended until 2024. So essentially, Ukraine is already in uh, technical default, essentially. The majority of funds have been coming from the United States and the United Kingdom. Both those economies have their own problems, their own economic challenges. Is there concern that at some point they won't be able to give as much as they've been giving? Um, well, I wouldn't say that the UK has been one of the biggest uh, providers of financial help. It's basically the US, yes, the lion's share, and the EU, the macrofinancial assistance from the EU. Um, Yes, there are. Uh, uh, there is some internal pushback to to this process, but there is still, I believe, a consensus at the end of the day that it would cost much more uh, if the security uh, situation got out of control, um, and and if Ukraine loses this war, it would have implications for broader international order, for the security. In Europe, and security in Europe is very important to the U.S. So at the end of the day, uh, I think there might be more scrutiny, given the um, Republican majority in the, in the U.S. or thin, uh, thin majority of the Democrats, depending on which part of the Congress you're speaking. Um, there may be more scrutiny, but at the end of the day, it seems like um, at the moment the international partners um, actually are planning to make sure that this help is more regular this year than last year and so that they um, indeed make sure there is around $3 billion a month uh, this year. Ukrainian officials have suggested this idea of turning to uh, Russian assets, seized assets, to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine. How viable is that as an idea? It's it's um, it's a slow process because uh, legally, uh, so there's there's definitely a desire to make Russia pay, uh, and a result to make sure Russia pays uh, for the re reconstruction, if not everything, um, but at least part. Um, but the Western partners want to make sure they don't set a legal precedent where all central banks will be afraid that their assets uh, can be. Uh, can be seized, and then it will be a problem, essentially, for dollar as a reserve currency. Um, so the process will be will be slow and legally very um, very thorough. At the moment, there is already some 
early progress already being made and even on the conditions where this money will be temporarily used and then returned. I mean, uh, it's not an easy process and I think Ukrainian economy will not be able to wait until uh, this issue is resolved. So Russian money, I don't think, will be coming first. Um, for this purpose. Oh, really interesting to speak to you, Yevgenia Slepsova, senior economist at Oxford Economics, talking to us there from London. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us by tweeting me at Marlene Said and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or you can drop us an email, counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. And there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Marlene Saeed from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>